talked about it last time when we said yeah. it was the retiring of the old Lacod penthouse and out with the old in with the new and now we got two different wings how cool new is that new year new me new year new wings baby but yeah, yeah, it feels good, bro. Can't beat it, can't beat it, can't beat it. Ladies it and gentlemen, good. boys and girls, children of all ages, it is I, the diligent, vigilant, meticulous, sagacious, conscientious, analytical, methodical individual, D, D Chisel the Donis, here with the serial entrepreneur, the Filipino prince, Tycoon, 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 Rene Lacard, and this is, we are, Tycoon. No, we're not. No, no, we're, we're not both Tycoon. I mean, technically. You're a Tycoon. Yeah, oh, but we, oh, we oh, can't. Oh, sorry, you're a Ty. I'm not gonna say it. Yeah, you can't <laughs> separate the two. That, it, 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 it's all taken. Oh, so we'll talk about starting it's 2024. Only okay, it's only okay if I. Well, <laughs> you, you, you are Asian. Some people would let it roll. Some so people would let it. I'm the Thai. Oh, you're the Thai. Well, well that, that, that's a different conversation. <laughs> that would be right. could, That could be the name of the podcast if I was actually Thai. But oh. that, that would be wild. <laughs> Insert <laughs> Dr. Umar. <laughs> he just walks in there and so, well, we got a problem. But this is episode 26 of the Assiduous Podcast. <laughs> 26, baby. It's half 26. a year. 26. Yeah, half a year. Half a year. We're almost there. We're Six almost there. Six months of podcasting. Yeah, man. It's dope. How you feeling? How you feeling? Bro, life. This is crazy, right? Yeah, I it just is. moved. Got a wife. Got a baby on the way. Got a oh, new that's house. right. I think the last time we hadn't announced that you were indeed expecting. So we got a, we got a bunch of new things happening. It just feel like life is moving really fast. Yeah. You know? But I feel good, man. How about you? How's your New Year going? New Year's going all right. I also am moving, not quite into a, you know, a state per se. Villa. Yeah, but I... I, I Manor. I'm, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but it's a villa somewhat. There's like a moat situation There's downstairs, like, yeah, downstairs yeah, near the concierge. Crazy. They got running water and Castle. shit. Castle. Sensational, man. Uh, yeah. Sensational. My, my, my level yeah, up moving. is not at that quite level, but we're moving at not necessarily the same pace, but I've reached the level that you were previously at and then we're on the new way up. New year, new places for both of us, man. Right, Let's right, right. So uh, this is the way I look at it. Everyone's like, as long as you're making progress, as long as you're not stopping, you're like, it's inevitable to be somewhere else. So, yeah, man, it's it's cool. But talk more about your place. What made you want to move? Because I know you've you've been very frugal. Yeah. You've been anti. Not, I don't say anti, but you've been like, let me not flex on these motherfuckers. But recently. You just got a new place. You signed the contract, signed the deal. Yes, yes. I got the approval actually yesterday, right? So then uh, I got the approval yesterday. I had to, you know, level up. Because the one thing they always yeah. say is, like, if you introduce a big idea to a small mind, they'll never be able to understand. But I've Ooh, always wait, had someone. That. Yeah, so if you introduce a big idea to a small mind, it's never going to be able to register in their <laughs> head. So with that being the case, I've always been somebody who has a big mind, big goals. Yeah. So if that's the case, I'm going to have to level up. And then I started doing a little bit of research on people who are at the top and people who are ascending. You can't be in a situation if your goal is 100000 a month, which would make you a millionaire, you can't expect to only have expenses that is yeah. about like, ah, two grand, three grand, there's no way. So if you want to play the game, you got to play at a higher level. Facts. And the best way to do that is you got to level up where you're sleeping at night. Well, I tell people all the time, because there's a big thing that goes on, on the internet. It's like, Whenever I flex anything, they're like, a real millionaire wouldn't do that. It's like, because they're not real fucking millionaires. You're 100%. talking about these, like, mil like, these millionaires that take 70 years to become a millionaire. Like, they buy a house in the 20s or the 30s mm -hmm. or maybe the 40s. They buy a house in the 40s for, like, 100 bucks, and now it's worth a million dollars. Right. You know, like, that's how they became millionaires. That's why they're living so frugally. But when I talk millionaires, I'm talking people that make $100,000 a month. Right. And I can tell you from experience, like, most of the time, these people that say, oh, I make a million dollars, but I just don't show it full of shit and okay, i think we had talked about full it prior but then i my biggest thing is like all right when you categorize yourself as a millionaire because essentially million is only um it's only if you're like net worth like if you yeah. have the net worth of a million then you're a millionaire so right. if you're somebody whose house is you're, you have assets that now is worth over a million you're a millionaire yeah. but what's your active income exactly. if i'm somebody who's making quarter you know mil per month I'm really a millionaire. a millionaire. If I'm somebody who's making that 100K a month, you're really a millionaire so because each, at, yeah. each year you're actually accumulating a million dollars. When I look at a millionaire, this is what I think. If you were to lose everything that you worked for, mm -hmm. how fast would you become a millionaire given your active income? So let's say you're making 70 grand a year, right? But you're a millionaire. If you lose everything, it would take you 20 years to become a millionaire again. You're not really a millionaire. Right. You know, so like I, I look at millionaires like if you can become a millionaire again in two, three years, you're an actual millionaire. Yeah. You look at any of these guys that have the crazy active incomes, 
right? They file bankruptcy, they lose it all, and then fucking uh, a year later, they're millionaires again. That's kind of what I define millionaire as. Yeah, I do too, because I have a rule of three, where if you do something and it's predictable, three years, then you can say you're that. So if yeah. somebody, whenever they say, oh, I make six figures or whatever, if you did it three years consecutively, all right, you're a six-figure earner. But if you're somebody who just had a great year and you've never been able to replicate that, you can't say that's the case. Because there's I a ton of people who have made, like, let's just say you have a great year. Coming out of the pandemic in 2020, shit ton of people made money, right? Yeah. And then there was people who was making half a million dollars. There's people who made million dollars, a bunch Cash. of like these gurus, whatever the case may be. Yeah. They had shit ton of bread. But then 2021, 2022 came, you may have made made half a million in 2020, probably made a quarter million in 2021, and then now you're at 40,000. Yeah. You're at 50,000. It's not predictable because you just had a great boom, and then you were just on the downswing. You were still well, able to bring in money. It's the equivalent of someone like a one-hit wonder. Right. You know, there's people that catch like instant fame, and then they can't follow up on it. Mm -hmm. So I think longevity plays a big part of it. That, that's like when you look at any entrepreneur, like real entrepreneur, it's not because they caught a boom, and then like they just coasted. It's because they have predictable, consistent. Mm -hmm. Drake drops an album, you know exactly what you're gonna get. Right. You know, fucking Kevin Durant plays a basketball game, you know what you're gonna get. Like that predictable, that predictability, that consistency. That's kind of what makes somebody a millionaire. Yeah. And then while I was studying, that to bring that back to you know why I decided to make the move was I would look at these individuals like, all right, cool. If you're somebody who's earning a million, how much are you spending per month? Yeah. Right. Now, if you're somebody who's expenses is the same as the income then you're just batting even at that point like you're yeah. not you may have made a million but you spent a million to make the million and now you have nothing mm -hmm. but if they're spending let's just say about 25 30 40 percent in order to get you know that 60 percent on the back end well i think something like that would be worth it and then you kind of just figure out how you would you know lower the expenses as you start to elevate but i say all that to say had to do you know the move and then also you want to have a spot to where you feel comfortable inviting yeah. you know people because you never know who you'll meet and i think one True. of the coolest things that i experience last year was anytime I would go and I traveled like a motherfucker last year anywhere I would go after whatever venue that we went to party whatever the case was we would have like an after party at somebody's house mm. so whether it's your house whether your apartment and you yeah. go in there and you feel like you're somewhere worth going to I'm like you know what I need one of those yeah. let me go get myself a building that has like a 24-hour concierge let me and go get some spot where they got a conference well, room and all that other stuff part about that right like uh, I haven't seen your place yet. I want to see pictures, actually. Maybe show me after. But in a high rise like that, especially so especially something like yours, to the average human, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. At least to me, at least it was. I remember the first time I came to Miami. I, this was I was probably making 20, 30 grand a month. But it was the first time I came to Miami. I had seen all of these high rises, and this guy. We w ended up going to like this guy's high rise. I had met him. He was like, "Yo, come." He invited a bunch of people. We go there. And really average place. It's about the size of like my living room, right? It was an apartment, size of my living room, but I thought it was the sickest thing. I was like, bro, this is so sick because I was the average human being. Right. So I'm like, this is amazing. How much do you pay for this? He was like, I pay four grand a month. I'm like, holy shit, like it's crazy. So anything like high rise, right? Especially yours because you have a bigger one. It's going to blow people away. They're going to be like, oh, this is sick. Right. You know, it fits, it fits you. Uh, and it, it elevates you above the average human being. Yeah, and then also my the second reason why is the one thing that I had to work on last year that I really was building on, and I think I want to take that to a whole other level because I got past the money block of having to spend on you know experiences, spending to get into rooms, but the social portion of everything was always my biggest issue yeah. because I became like a hermit in yeah. the midst of creating content or whatever, so I never really branched out, really met with people or whatever. So last year was just the social portion so now being in a building where people are paying that price point you know for one they got money they've got a network oh, yeah. and you're actually able to build and cultivate relationships with them so that was also something that played a large role because now yeah. let's just say I meet somebody in the mail room or something like that or I happen to meet you downstairs or I go to yeah. the conference room and somebody's doing work I can now introduce myself to everybody within that proximity mm -hmm. and build relationships there because yeah. how many times you see somebody move into like an apartment complex or maybe you move into a neighborhood you don't know anybody nobody knows you i want to be in a spot where okay cool i just moved in great everybody on the same floor as me 
I'm bringing you, oh, well, here's a bag of like chocolates or a bag. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm just moving in. Here's my apartment number or whatever. Always stop by. This is what I do. Hey, I'm the chiseled Adonis. Come and meet me, whatever the case may be. Oh, what you got going on? Oh, I see somebody. They have like a pool thing. Yeah. They have like a party area that you can rent out. I'd probably do one of those and then just send a mass invite to everybody who's in the building. Yo, I rented out this spot for like three hours. Come on down and hang That's out or some idea. shit. Just a way to just connect with people. Because if yeah. there's one thing that I learned, meeting with people who are at the top, they're all incredibly personable and they're great people to be around. Well, it's weird, right? Like, this is what I've noticed. People at the top are cool to people at the top. Right. Let's say you're someone that comes, you have nothing to offer. They might be nice to you. I think a lot of these people are nice, but like they don't really want to spend time with you. So I think because you have something to offer, you're an interesting individual, you're an interesting person. It's so funny, my wife is upstairs on her thing. Um, <laughs> oh, you can see it from the- from, so from crazy. The, yeah, like, to the upstairs, how cool is that? Um, yeah, she's, she's uh, doing that. That's awesome. Um, oh, but yeah, so uh, because you're an interesting individual, you have such a unique career, a unique business, People are like, oh, I, I'm going to connect with this guy. Everyone wants to connect with you. I don't know mm. not one person that wouldn't want to connect with you, you know? Right. Because whatever it is you do, you, you provide some value in some form of way. So it, it's just that kind of like the way it works. Yeah, and, and it's you want to be somebody who can leave a lasting impression. If there's anything that yeah. I've learned, somebody who's a vibe will always be invited somewhere. Facts. Like, even if you have nothing to offer, if you're a good time, like, they hang out with yep. somebody. Like, yo, I remember we was hanging out with this dude. Yep. You could be the brokest person in the room. You have 100%. absolutely no money, but you leave a lasting impression. They will always invite you. 100%. Because you don't want to be somebody who's rich and is a square. You don't want to be somebody who's just elevating, but then you're also a square. So you've got to have have that social aspect yeah, and I, mean, I felt so like I was falling out of touch with that so I had to get outside and remind people one thing I realized for that like when I was broke one of the easiest ways for me to network with like richer people than me was always just through women mm. like my one skill was like a good salesperson but I would just bring like four or five girls wherever oh, I went yeah, that's a cheat code and it always works because now the rich guys are like oh I, let's invite Renee because he always brings four or five girls mm -hmm. you know and it's, if they're hot it helps so like they're always just kind of like that now that I'm married my my marketing not my, my networking has changed right you have to like change the value that you provide so now it's, it comes from more of a like i'm a cool marketing guy right perspective. but then again you still can kind of play the same game to a certain extent because yeah, but if if you were to like with the extension of your wife's friends or maybe if you still happen to have those female because it was a different dynamic back yeah. then but because that a lot of people don't recognize how important that is like Dan Bilzerian, you know, would do it where he, although he would finance those girls to be around him, but if you're a dude who always has just a bunch of beautiful women who's around you, people are going to want to be around you because they want to get around the beautiful women. Yeah. As we have a, uh, I believe this one's Bijou who just Bijou, uh, yeah, joined. Yeah, dog that joined the podcast. Joined the podcast. You have anything to say, dog? He escaped. No, you don't. He escaped from the, the West Wing. Right. No, he escaped from upstairs somewhere. <laughs> Imagine being in a space to where you don't have to go outside to go walk the dog. The dog kind of just walks around. Yeah. You just got to go outside to pee. And even I can if play, you want to pee inside, you can. I can play in my house. If I throw this all the way over there, it's fucking like... That's a that's a far right. That's a far We've got go. a forty yard dash in Literally, here just to, yeah. to to paint the picture to you for you guys to know how large you know this this yeah. penthouse just so happens to be. I love it, man. It's such a good feeling waking up to this. I'm like, fuck, I did that, bro. Right. And that's that's actually I'm I'm glad you brought that up because that's yeah. one of the most important things. Like people will move based on like your price point and how much you could afford, which makes sense. But when you make a decent amount of money and you or you save enough to where you have a nest egg, I would implore every everybody just say all right cool let's just say if total for the year it would be we'll go with the average person if, if you're making about like 40 some thousand per year mm -hmm. if you save up about like 25 move somewhere for just one year that will probably cost about 48 or something like that total just to have the experience of being somewhere you wake up in the morning and you have you know a balcony or you have a good view to where you have a view of the city or something like that you want to be somewhere where you wake up motivated yeah no because the thing about this it's like you wake up you're like and you almost have to reward yourself i think mm -hmm. like piggybacking off of that you have to reward yourself with understanding like yo i did this, this is like what i earned i earned yeah. this i earned this because we me and my wife were talking about it there's a penthouse uh aston martin tower Penthouse is $59 million. Shit. Huge. It's probably going to be one of the biggest penthouses in Miami, if not the biggest. Oh, it's new construction, or is it yeah, already? Yeah, brand oh, new. Okay, got you. It's $59 million for this penthouse. It comes with the Aston Martin. 
It's mm-hmm. a crazy, just crazy thought. Good yeah. lord! So you become a tenant, and then it it comes. Well, you give buy, you, yeah, you buy the you buy the penthouse, and they give you a, a three million dollar Aston Martin. Oh, that's penthouse. fucking it's awesome! It's a limited edition. There's like only a hundred of them. Nice. Yeah. So, but this place is like crazy. And me and my wife were talking about it. There was a, a billion dollar lottery thing, right? She's like, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna buy a lottery ticket. We're gonna win, and we're gonna move into that. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. Mm. Cause what you get it? Let's say you win the lottery, you get the penthouse. It's like it's not the same as like living in a place where you know you earned it. Right, right. So when I wake up, right. I look at the the window, at the ocean. I'm kind of like, yeah, I fucking did that. Because there's, there's a pride. level of fulfillment, it comes with the right? Pride and right. Fulfillment. But if it, if it's just given to you, I don't know. It won't hit the same. Like, yeah, I'm it's sure never be the nice. same. Because it'll I, be nice, but you're like, ah, you, you don't feel deserving of it. That's probably why so many lottery winners, you know, when they do win, end up going broke. Because mm-hmm. they, they blow through everything. I think as you ascend at a steady pace and you work for it, it means more. Yeah. Because a lot of people always say like, oh, you know, if I had that kind of money, or if you give me that kind of money, they would be able to do so much. But it's not really the case. Like if yeah. you win the lottery and you get like 400 million and you're like, oh, well, you know, that'll set me up for life. I could do certain sort of investments. You could do that if you just go get some credit yeah. for the same thing. The same skill it takes to flip 100 to 1,000, uh, 1,000 to 10,000. It's the same skill across the board. But if you never had the skill, you can't say, all right, well, now all of a sudden I'm going to get it out of the blue. And if you now take that money, you move somewhere, the network of people around you aren't going to respect you to the same level. Like you yeah. have somebody who was an investment banker who started their own stuff, ended up, you know, building a multi-million dollar nine-figure company. Now they're living in that location. You got a retired athlete who worked their entire life to get somewhere. They're living in that location. You got another business mogul tycoon. They're tycoon. working in, in that location. You got some people who got old money. Their family, you know, has corporations and things of that nation. They're living inside that building. And then here you are, a lottery winner. Yeah. So they might not respect you the same way, but you can kind of override that if you happen to be somebody who can be, you know, cool to be around. Yeah. But it can't be the at the no, point where I, I you're still, trying so like, hard. Let's say you're a vibe. You, people aren't going to respect you from a business perspective. Right, right. So great example. Right. I, I'm confident that wherever I go, I can get into business with anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, anybody that, that sees me or talks to me, we can get into business. Uh, but let's say you, you inherited it, or you're a trust fund kid. You're not like, you say, hey, let's go into business. And it's like, well, you've never made money. I don't want to go into business with you. Mm-hmm. At least for me, that's how it would be. Right. right? Like maybe if you came in as an investor and you literally just didn't tell me what to do, you just provided the money, we can do something like that. But like you as an operator, as a, as an entrepreneur, someone with like decision-making power, I don't know if I would respect that. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm really big on the fact of like, you earned it, bro. And same with you. Like, I'm excited for you because you earned it, and it's going to feel like one of those things you wake up, you're like, fuck, oh, man, this is great. Yeah, that was the biggest thing because one of when the things that in? I've learned, I move in on um, February 10th. Okay. I'm moving on February 10th, and that's going to be dope because I usually don't do, like, the behind-the-scenes stuff, but I'm going to yeah. try something different this year and do, like, vlogs. I'm going to have the live stream and everything like that, just IRL content. I'll probably set up a tripod, hit, you know, live stream, and then while I go through my entire day while sitting in what will be my office for the very first first time where I don't have to like my bed's right there and then I'm recording right here and then it's just a brutal sort of situation because you can never separate from home and work everything was always on top of each other so now if I have a separate room or something like that I won't feel as if it's like home and and, or I could go upstairs to one of the conference areas and do stuff up there so it's a whole different dynamic and I want to be able to document all of that because Mm -hmm. although in the past I never thought it was important but I think it is very important to show the growth as you continue to ascend I think it's inspiring the people right because it it normalizes you as a human like one of the biggest things I posted when I got this place and it, it hit the post hit uh, I posted like my where I was living 10 years ago mm-hmm. and then this and it's like the difference that 10 years can make right because before I, I always knew what a penthouse was I had never experienced it mm-hmm. or I would never like imagine what it was actually like you know so like for me to like get a place like this which is just ridiculous um, I'm like damn this is this is four times bigger than the house I grew up in Ain't that crazy? Yeah. Ain't that crazy? And it's in, in 10 short years. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, man, I, I, it's, it's one of those things where it'll make you cry some, like, thug tears because you're like, bro, this is, I did that. Yeah, and most people don't recognize how close they are. 
to the life that they want to live. Yeah. Because you, if you have like the money block or you have just the mental you're block. You're like a year away. Yeah, right. It's always like a year away. Right. It's only because it, if you committed yourself for 12, I think 12 to 36 months is like the, the area. Yeah. Because if you sacrifice three years of your life, you put down the phone, you don't just be a consumer of social media, you're not somebody who's just sitting at home all day watching Netflix. If you just committed the time for 12 to 36 months, you would be surprised the kind of progress that you'd be able to make. Like, yeah. it's, it's one of those things where once you start, you're like, wait a minute, hold on. Let me talk to this person who lives in this house. How long did it take for you to get here? And if they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, it just took me about 18 months. Really? So if you just do the same, life would be amazing. So it's yeah. one of those things that I think a lot of people have to take into account because this, this, this isn't an overnight. I think that's the significance of the 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you had there. Because people go, oh, well, you know, six months I've tried. Well, six months ain't long enough. You got to yeah. go for longer than that. And if you really commit yourself, you'll be able to accomplish it. 100%. Sorry, my dog is barking, so I'm having – thank you. <laughs> yeah. She heard him barking. Yeah, she needed like, the missus to come yeah, grab um, up the dog who was freed himself. Yeah, no, I – I think that 2024 is going to be a good year. I'm super excited. One of the big goals, actually, I was thinking is the pod, this podcast thing. We, we want to do a lot more with the podcast. Um, and it's interesting because this is six months in. Right. And we've just been pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And we haven't run out of things to talk about. Right. We've been talking about different shit, whether it's politics, whether it's uh, pop culture, whether it's sports. Like, I feel like we have a pretty good grasp of that. I mean... And, and you'll see it like occasionally the, the, every single video one, you'll catch one little that catch the algorithm mm -hmm. people start talking about it so it's a it's a really interesting thing to look at I mean right now what do you think is, is popping right now in, in the last probably 30 minutes of the podcast what, what do you think is popping right now that we can talk about that you're seeing all over the world around the world uh, not around the world just in general like, like something culturally relevant because with the start of 2024 right now I know they uh, recently they had the Cat Williams uh, interview that he had what he was Bro. talking about everything I think right now it's got about 35 million <laughs> views on Shannon Sharp uh, last time I looked there was like 22 million Bro, oh boy yeah it's growing it's growing crazy and I'll say this much as somebody who's in comedy or yeah. wh when I was in stand-up heavily I've taken a step away from it but um, it was one of those mic drop pipe bomb kind of interviews where he talked about those type of people where you start looking at like how they were to get to their part like a Kevin Hart Art, yeah. Uh, uh, um, a number of different people. You're like, man, it starts to look like it's rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat with I mean, everything I, that they got going on. I looked at it though, and I was kind of like, I looked at the Cat Williams thing. I was, I, I thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. I thought it was hilarious. I think Cat Williams is so funny. I think the one thing that rubs me the wrong way, I think he's like a poster for like the lack of accountability. Right, right. There's Cat, a little bit of bitterness that exists there. Yeah, because Cat Williams, he could have been Kevin Hart. Right. But he squandered the opportunity. I don't know if he was like doing drugs. I don't know if like he couldn't pass. It. Kevin Hart said something he couldn't pass a drug test, mm -hmm. so he lost a role in a movie. But it's like everything was lining up for Cat Williams mm -hmm. to be that guy, right? To be like an Eddie Murphy, to be like a, a Kevin Hart, mm -hmm. to be like a Dave Chappelle. But then, dude, just like squandered it in the wrong direction. And now, like he comes back, and obviously he had such like cultural relevance that it's never gonna go away because he has such a big impact. But every time he talks about it, I'm like, I love it, it's hilarious. Like if it was just like, if he was doing it to be funny, mm -hmm. it's hilarious. But you can tell that he kind of means it seriously. Like he'll say, I'm the richest man in the world. I'm like, bro. <laughs> mm. And it's funny because obviously it's a joke, but it's like, I run really fast. And I run like a, a four second. Yeah, like, he said like a four four. Yeah. He could run like a four one. I thought that was hilarious. But I looked at it from him using like the podcast as a way to like do his own stand up special okay. for two and a half some hours. Because I looked at it as yeah. like performative art. But there was a lot of truths that was in there. So that's thing. Do you think it's performative art? Do you think he's just fu being serious? But he's no, no, funny? it's it's because there's a lot of truth that you'll find within a joke. And I, I think, think it's satire. But I think like there's a level of like. He's being almost like being serious. No, no, because I think he was much more serious than because I looked at it as it was it, he was putting on a show, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of truths that was in there because there's a number of people who've been able to reach mass amount of success yeah. just by either a it was selling out or you're just doing whatever they need you to do in order right. to go in the sand. Like with the Steve Harvey thing, I think that was a hundred percent on point regarding with the Bernie Mac because if you ever watched The King of Comedy, you know Bernie was the funniest person of the four yeah. with D.L. Hughley, Cedric the Entertainer. 
know, Steve Harvey, and then ultimately there was Bernie Mac. There was by far Bernie Mac was the funniest guy who was there. Mm -hmm. And then when he was talking about the stealing of material, that happens so much in comedy. Like the, one of the biggest stories with the Carlos Mencia in the mid 2000s with mm -hmm. the stealing of jokes. And I noticed it myself, even on the lowest level when I had first started. Like that you was go, Joe Rogan who exposed that. Right, right? it was Joe Rogan who exposed it. Cause I remember going to like, you'd go to like an open mic or something like that. Yeah. You're just working on material. There would be other, not necessarily established comedians, but people who are also, you know, they're on the night circuit. They're just doing everything there. They would hear you talk about something in your real life experience. And they would take that and go to the stage. And because they got more reps in the game, now they've since shape shifted your story into yeah. their own. And now they're taking your entire joke. And what sucks is because they're, you know, established, you're not. If you try to go to the stage and they're doing it, now they're going to pretty much police you yeah. on your own lived yeah. experience. Because it's one thing if you have just a very generic, broad kind of joke. Like, oh, well, you're just joking about the MTA or you did the yeah. bus or the airfare or something like that. But if it's your own unique lived experience and somebody steals that, you're, that's your entire essence. Yeah. So I think Cat Williams was on point when he was talking about that. Well, it's, it's weird because, like... I think I'm part of the problem. Mm. Two things. One, I love, I love. The only reason I know the, the Carlos Mencia thing, I think comedy is one of those. It's an art form. People right. don't realize that. People think, oh, I just go up and tell jokes. Like, nah. There's, there's ways to deliver. I watched the Dave Chappelle's new special. Yeah. The Dreamer, have you seen it? No, no. I only Bro, seen clips. Dave Chappelle is my comedy goat. Yeah, he's a master. I watch it, and the motherfucker is so profound. The way he builds up mm -hmm. a punchline. Normally, people are like little story, two minutes, punchline. Cool. Dave Chappelle will like he'll build it up, he'll get you emotionally invested, yeah. and he'll hit you with it, and mm -hmm. you're like, this is and you'll start dying. So I watch comedy and I'm kinda like, this is an art form in itself. It's it's beautiful, and if you master it, you can get really good at it. And everyone has a different style. It's almost yeah. like like martial arts. Like people have a different style of fighting, but if you get really good at it, you see the nuances. So comedy, I like look at it, I'm kinda like, this is cool. I study it as like a an art form and I see things that like might be imperceptible to other people I, I really love it I love comedy shows I, lo I love comedy uh, and I use it when I speak so I mm -hmm. use elements of stand-up comedy when I speak uh, but I think I'm part of the problem in the sense that sometimes I look at people and, and this is just business content as a whole right mm -hmm. I look at people I look at the way they they have like when, let's say someone makes a video I watch the video gets like 200 views and I know why it's getting 200 views. They have a great, they have a great idea, but the way they communicate that idea, mm -hmm. it just doesn't hit in the same way. So I've gone and I've like tweaked the idea and made it more uh, palatable mm -hmm. for the average everyday human. And it'll get 100,000 views or 200,000 views. Mm -hmm. And people could theoretically say, oh, well, you stole my joke. And it's like, oh, Drake says it best. There was, I guess he stole a beat off of P. Diddy. Right. And he was like, listen, man, you wouldn't have made it that. It wouldn't have become that if, if you if you made the song, it wouldn't have been a hit, but I made it, so it's a, it's a hit. In the same way, like, you, you made your video, you said your video, I made it with the same message, but mine just hit because of the way I communicated it. So with comedy, it's weird, because it's like, yeah, you can have a joke, oh, I have a funny story, how my friend accidentally kicked his cat. I don't know, something silly, right? Mm -hmm. But you could say it, you could deliver it in, like, the worst way. And it has, like, it's a funny story, but the way you delivered it didn't hit, and then someone takes it, and their delivery is much better. Right. The, the way they build it up is much better, and it becomes a big joke. I don't know how I feel about that, because it's like, are you going to let that, that little thing, because if you had it, it would have been wasted. Mm -hmm. You know, or are you going to take that and potentially turn it into something great? It, it all depends because, for one, if it's like your lived experience and that's like you, because with comedy, oftentimes your entire life is tied to it. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody like, for example, like a Matt Reif, right? When he went, he blew up and everything. It was his lived experience. Somebody like a Bill Burr, somebody like a Patrice O'Neill, somebody like a Dave Chappelle. The, they are great masters at their craft, but you have to continually, you know, work at that. And one of the things now with social media where it's difficult is if you're on the lower end and you're working on material, but people are recording, the way stand-up is supposed to work is you come up with a set, you keep doing it and refining it until you get to, all right, cool, now I know how I want to you know, deliver right. this. More often than not, you're working on that set for a year minimum, yeah. unless you're somebody like a, uh, um, like a Louis C.K., somebody like him, or, or maybe even like a Cat Williams, where you're constantly changing the material year on end, like a, a George Carlin, where yeah. you have a new special every single year or something like that. But it's so difficult to get to that 
that level. So if you're on a lower end and you're working on something, you're like, all right, cool. Yo, I got like four months in to this material trying to go and master it. Somebody walks in. That's an interesting story. They just take that, and because Snatch they already it. know how to structure, layer, and all this Fair. other stuff, they take your entire lived experience, take it to the stage. Well, now you can't do that no more. Fair. And you're just there like, oh, wait a minute. This, this, this is me. Yeah. And it's happened on so many different levels, and right. it's a cutthroat business. So if you, because you're at a point now where on the business side, you understand marketing. You understand how to go viral and everything. So you could see an idea. You may not take it word for word. You may dress it up and make it better because how many people on social media are making you know similar content about you know topics Every, bro, every everybody is yeah. but you have to figure out a way to you know make it unique and curate it to your style the only difference is in comedy it's it's so story. it's personal it's personal it's intimate yeah. and then now you take that and you make it you know your own and now you're sitting there like oh wait a minute you, this this is that ain't yeah. even your story you never experienced that this is real to me it, there's yeah. an emotional attachment i think that's part of the game though so like i, I look at the world as a competitive mm -hmm. it's a competitive world and a great example let's say you have a business idea and that's why everyone gatekeeps their business ideas like i don't want to tell anyone because they're going to copy it mm -hmm. and it's true though to an extent like let's say you have a business idea but you just don't know how to do it Big company sees it, they just fucking copy you, they do it 10 times better, they right. execute it, you're fucked, mm -hmm. right? That's just the nature, of the, that's the nature of the world. You gotta get good, otherwise someone's just gonna blow you out the water. Yeah, but that's the thing, right? Because if, if somebody like Cat Williams, he's able to survive because he's so good at what it is that he does, yeah. right? And he's been doing it now for, a, it's going on 40 years. Yeah. You know, he's been doing, well, no, actually about like 30, 30 plus. So yeah, I guess you could yeah, say like 40 years because he started like 91. So at that point it's like 30 and he's pushing like uh, uh, about like 32, 33 years he's been in comedy. But he's so incredibly good. He was also, he was speaking for like the comedian's comedian, somebody who's coming up at the bottom. And there was even a video that started circulating on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, where um, they had an old video of Bernie Mac when he was talking about like, hey, you know, you don't want, if you're an upcoming comedian, you don't want to be telling jokes in a room of comedians. But the problem is when you're coming up, open mics, who's working on their material at open mics? Other yeah. comedians. If you go up to, you know, just a random crowd, you get some stage time or whatever you have to eat bombing and freaking failing left and right to figure out how it works but there's still other comedians so you got to get so good to where even if they steal your stuff it doesn't matter yeah. but it's so demoralizing going through that's why so many people can't make it but i also think like like if you because we live in the world of social media let's say you someone steals your joke if you're clipping all your jokes and posting them you can be like, yo, look, he said this here, but I have proof that I said it first right. two years ago. Now you make the other person look bad. Yeah, yeah, but you have to you have to get to the point where you perform it so good to where now they'll be like, oh, fuck that guy yeah. who stole my stuff, or fuck that girl who stole my stuff. Fair. So you gotta you gotta get so good. And that was one of the things that he yeah. was talking about. Cause it was like if you re if you go back and you listen to the entire thing in its entirety, because a lot of times people will just it's two and a half hours. Right. So unless you have time to sit there and listen to everything through, or maybe you listen to like a portion and then you finish it up from there. You're going to go watch clips, yeah. right? And throughout the entire thing, it's like in between the lines of how he's speaking to those, those people. And if you're a comedian and you're listening to it, you're like, okay, I understand. Because yeah. you, you want to be righteous as a comedian to a certain degree. Like Patrice mm -hmm. O'Neill always talked about like there's a self-sabotage at one point where you got to like. So if I were to com compare mm -hmm. comedians to athletes, here's how I would do it. Patrice O'Neill is like Kobe. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it like that because – Every comedian, they say Patrice O'Neal's their favorite. He, he's your comedian's favorite yeah, comedian. Yeah, your comedian's in favorite comedian. In the same comedian. way that right. Kobe Bryant is your athlete's favorite athlete. Right. Right, because like, like the general populace is like, oh, Kobe Bryant's not in the top 10 NBA, like NBA players of all time. But mm -hmm. every single NBA player is like, no, Kobe's in the GOAT conversation. Right. So like a, a friggin' Patrice O'Neal would be like a friggin' Kobe. And you have like a Kevin Hart who's like a LeBron. Mm. You would have like a... Uh, Eddie Dave Murphy. Cha Dave Chappelle's like a freak. Him, Richard Pryor, they're kind of like the uh, uh, the Michael Jordans. Well, also Eddie Murphy was like the Michael Jordan because he set the standard like as far as like sold out like box office. Yeah, but then... but he had the but, highest ever, and then Kevin Hart broke that, so it's like an MJ LeBron thing. That's yeah, but then with MJ, because the thing with him was he left, came back, and then... This is a super nuanced then, conversation, because right, you, right, you have to understand comedy and fucking, and fucking yeah, sports. Yeah, because so like, this, is, this, is, this one's a little tough, because with Eddie, he had Raw and Delirious, and then just left and went to movies, and, and it was one of those kind of what-ifs he never left. Yeah. How big could he have gotten? With MJ, we had a chance to, oh, wait, uh, because you do and have that I, mystique of when he left the 
the Bulls, man, could they have won eight straight? Could this have that? But then he came back. If Eddie, if Eddie had came back and then still was on top, yeah. then it kind of works. But I, I get, I get exactly what you're saying. He, he set the bar. Right. Like, Eddie, I get exactly what you're saying. You know, because and I look at like like a Richard Pryor. You you gotta look at Richard Pryor kind of like a like before MJ how you have like fucking yeah because him and George like magic, Carlin like is like Magic Johnson yeah Ma La Magic Johnson and Larry Bird yeah because like yeah. those guys are like nice right because yeah, Pryor enough. and Carlin is funny like Bird Bird and yeah. Bird Bird and Magic uh, um, Johnson and, and Larry Bird and then you have like a Eddie Murphy who's like an MJ and then you have yep. Kevin Hart who's like a LeBron mm -hmm. and you have a Patrice O'Neal who's like a Kobe like that's the way I, I look at it yeah you know? yeah because I I similar similarly in 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 comedy I always looked at it like that and then like what kind of comedian do you want to be because if you want to be the purest kind of person and you want to try to talk about everything that you want to be uh, somebody who has the range to talk about anything, you want to be versatile and you want to be cutthroat to where you don't walk on eggshells you also have to understand what comes with that yeah. you're not going to be somebody who's going to be able to do every single show because they're going to look at it like, oh, this guy's kind of controversial we don't want to deal with that you're going to end up like a Chappelle where anytime you grab the mic headlines galore is going to come yeah. out and pick apart what well, you said you got to roll with the punches because i think he's been able to he doesn't give a fuck first right. of all he doesn't give a right. fuck so he's been able to just like Nep he got a, like netflix is the king of woke media yeah 60 mil. And they're giving Chappelle money right. to make fun of trans people, which is wild, bro. Mm -hmm. So Chappelle got that fucking, he's bulletproof. Right, and, and the, the, the beautiful thing about him was he walked away. Walked where away. it reached, you know, 2004, he's at his peak, and then he was, ah, you know what, this is starting to get a little weird. Not about to do and then he that, yeah. walks away, turns down 60 million, you end up getting it back, you know, damn near 15 years later, yeah. and then you return, and it, it, there it is. Well, I think when you listen to Chappelle talk, he's like a prince, like he's a very principled man. Right. So like, like I don't know, when I look at other comedians, right? Specifically, like, like black comedians, they'll lean into their blackness, mm -hmm. and they'll make it almost like black comedy. That's the best way I could explain it. Okay. Chappelle, he does. He has parts of that, but then he'll like he'll he'll speak in such a profound way mm -hmm. that it speaks to everyone. Right. So it's not only like you're only speaking to your community. Exactly. Right. So he's able to have a white audience. He's able to have a black audience. He's able to have and an then, Asian where yeah. everybody feels like they're being seen. Great example. Right. Uh, I got. I got you. Great example. Joe Coy. Mm -hmm. Joe mm -hmm. Coy is a he's a Filipino comedian. You know Joe Coy, right? Yes. He bombed at the Glo Golden Globes recently. Um, I think he got too much mainstream like success now, so now he's doing the Golden Globes, and he's not funny for the regular people. He had a niche audience of like Asians and Mexicans that thought he was funny. Because I watched Joe Coy, like one of his specials, and I'm like, this is hilarious. It's funny because I'm Filipino. Right. So um, they blow up because they fit in that. Mark. Like Matt Rife, he's getting a lot of heat right now because apparently his special. I didn't see it, but apparently his yeah, special. Yeah, yeah. I only seen clips. I it didn't see the funny, entire but thing. But he was trying to prove that like, yo, I'm an actual comedian. I'm not just a crowd work girls comedian yeah but matt rife he was like the women the good looking guy and yeah the women and crowd work that was like his thing right right and he was like nah i'm not gonna be put in a box like that and then sure enough he like he did a special and everyone's like ah eh, he's not that good get back mm. in your box. yeah get back right, in your box right. go back to crowd work and doing mm -hmm. that kevin hart's another good example kevin hart i think is is really funny he's in my top five comedians of all time his newer stuff hasn't hit as much and he tries to make it relatable because, like, the what, what two special was it seriously funny? And there was another one that we just, I watched him, couldn't stop laughing. Mm -hmm. His two most recent ones, the motherfucker's just way too rich to be relatable anymore. Yeah. And he's almost trying to to do like a one size fits all comedy, mm -hmm. and doesn't hit in the same way that it used to. Like, I'll watch it, I'll giggle, I'll laugh. Some things are relatable, but like. It's not the same like gut laughing that I get from other right because in the beginning and that's one of the things and I remember uh, we talked about it in like the very first second or third episode where relatability as you ascend that's the biggest reason why people tend to hate on the those who are at the top because now you're not as relatable in comedy people want to feel like they're being heard or you're representing them in the midst of the special yeah Kevin Hart 
when he had cheated on his wife and everything of that nature, and people were anticipating for him to talk about it and everything, it never really hit and landed because it was still coming from somebody who's, you're at that level. You kind of can do it, and it makes sense why yeah. she would go and stay. And then every, because I had a chance to see Kevin Hart and Chris Rock live last year. Oh, was that uh, when, when Chappelle got attacked? Or no, Rock no after, got attacked? after Rock had gotten um, slapped, and he didn't, he didn't address it until, <laughs> um, he didn't address it until <laughs> afterwards. I saw funny, this was actually funny. I think, off the cuff, Kevin Hart's hilarious. Yeah. This is when he gave him the goat, right? Mm -hmm. It was him and Chappelle, and he gave them a, a pet goat as a gift. Oh, um, no, 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 that was because they I didn't do the Kevin the tape Hart for gave it. him a pet goat as a gift, and he said, mm -hmm. I'm naming him Will Smith. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. So I thought that was funny, but, uh. Yeah, so I had a chance to see them live, and Chris Rock still has, like, it doesn't, he doesn't have, like, the belly laugh kind of thing anymore. Yeah. So it gets to a point where I don't want to say they're not capable, but they just, they have a different sort of tone. Because I think you have to be a different level of funny when you're coming from nothing versus when you you finally, you know, made it. And there's those who can keep it, you know, keep you captivated those while jokes watching. Don't pay your bill. When the jokes gotta pay your bills, you're fucking hilarious. Right, right, because you play, second, you, you work into where the rents do. <laughs> yeah, the second the, the jokes, like, you'd be like, man, I, this, I could bomb. I don't give a fuck. I got, right. I live in my fucking Sky Mansion. It no longer, you're like, whatever. Yeah, but that, that's where it comes down to if 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 you want to be, uh, and this is what Patrice talks about, where it's like that level of righteousness yeah. in, in comedy. So if you want to be like the purest, purest of comedy, you have to be somebody who's willing to go into those uncomfortable locations despite what level that you're at. So who's uh, who's your favorite comedian? Like, who do you think is just the ones that will get the funniest ones out of you? Uh, well, Patrice Biggest was always one. my number one. It would be okay. uh, Patrice, George Carlin, Dave Chappelle, um, Bernie Mac, and then Bill Burr. Those have all. That, Bill Burr. That, yeah, those have been my. Because Bill Burr, the thing with Bill Burr is his take on like how life yeah. and everything. Because it comes from an angry man's perspective right. of everything. And then when you listen to him talk about things, it's like yo, you everybody is full of shit. Yeah. Like you, it, it, you can't act like your shit doesn't stink. I can't act like my shit doesn't stink. And I love that about Bill Burr because it keeps everybody leveled. And then you have the people like a Dave Attell, fucking hilarious individual. Somebody like a, uh, uh, um, a uh, what was it? What was his name? I forget it. He passed away early 90s. I forget his name. I probably Golly. Don't know. Uh, um, Bill Hicks. Hicks. Yeah, he had passed away early 90s. Hilarious dude. Uh, uh, Richard Pryor, of course. Eddie Richard Murphy, of funny. course. All of those Eddie guys, my funny. favorite thing about, like, with comedy is those who are able to tell a story, be real, and has that versatility to talk about anything and captivate an audience. Yeah. For me, that's like the comedian's comedian because yeah. you're not somebody who's not only not afraid to bomb, but you're also willing and you're comfortable with the uncomfortability of the it's, audience. I think it's the authenticity too like people sense it and it's like funny from a real perspective right you know so yeah i i get it i i really love comedy i look at all of it like i said i incorporate a lot of the elements of like delivery for comedy i was looking at some of the science behind it mm -hmm. like why people laugh and it's interesting you know the reason people laugh it's because uh their brain doesn't know how to process information hmm. so like my wife is upstairs closing a door hmm. um oh the plane's flying over yeah we're so close to the planes flying over us. So just right, right. Yeah. right. No, um, the people laugh because the brain doesn't process information correctly. So when someone says something and you don't expect it, it's like an unexpected thing. It gets you to like chuckle because your brain's like, what the fuck? Like, I don't understand. And it's like laugh. It's like a nervousness response. That's why mm -hmm. some people, when they get nervous, they laugh. They have yeah, like a right, nervous right, laugh. Right, right, right. Because their body's just releasing unprocessed emotion. So someone that can like elicit that out, elicit that out of you is is absolutely crazy. Um, but yeah, like, the way I look at it, in order to be great at comedy, it's like you said, you can't be afraid to, mm -hmm. to bomb, but you have to stay relatable regardless of how rich you get. Right, because once you get to the point where you're only able to appeal with those at the top, that needs to be your audience. Yeah. Like, you can't try to keep the same audience as you go and you ascend. It's not going to work. Yeah. Because if you got people who are into projects, now you're talking about rich people problems, they're just going to look at you like, well, I don't quite understand mm -hmm. any of that stuff. Like, you're talking about issues that you have with your penthouse, like, oh, man, you know, when I, my yeah. faucet's you know, running over here, but then down there, now it's so far from... They, they, they're going to look at you like, well... There's I got a, roaches. A, <laughs> How am I going to use this? There was a Kevin Hart uh, piece where, where he, he talks about, like, and I thought it was hilarious because I could relate to it. He talks about, like, do you want good dick or you want, like, a nice house? Mm -hmm. He talks about, like, how that he, now that he's rich, 
he can't lay down that dick anymore like he used to. Like back in the day when he was broke, he was that's all you for, had. He was fucking for coins, you right, know? Right. So he, like that was the entire premise of the joke. It's like I used to fuck. Now my wife complains because I don't be fucking the same. Cause I'm like tired from like working and I'm mm-hmm. rich. So like, what you want? You want good dick? Or you want like uh, a nice house? Right. You want a big house or good dick? And then like he talks about like I'll give you one one day a month with like good dick. And I laughed because I was like, this is funny. Cause I can right. Relate so to where this. you got a reminder? Hey, hey, listen now. You know like, what's yeah, going so on? I right. Could relate right. To this, so I thought it was hilarious. Cause like I'd be feeling the same exact way. I've showed it to like 10, 20 people. They're kind of like, meh. I'm like, damn. I thought it was hilarious. So I I get what you mean. Like the the your comedy has to be like mass appeal and the same goes for music the same goes for yeah everything. it's like the marvin Hagler quote where it's, it's hard to get up to run at 5 a.m in silk pajamas yeah it's the same thing across the board because as you ascend and conor mcgregor is unfortunately a victim of it as, as you ascend it's not the same anymore because when rent is due your backup is against the wall and everything's got to go it's like the m&m eight mile jay like yeah. you just lose just you must perform or everything's That's going to shit the great people from the average people so a great example like lebron james mm-hmm how does this motherfucker? He he got a billion dollars and he's still putting in all that work for what? Right. But that's what makes him great. You look at somebody like a. This is a, an effect across the league. But Jordan Poole got a max contract. Trash. The worst player in the league. He has the Trash. worst uh, plus minus. It's any bad. Player. It is bad. But you see it a lot. Anytime someone gets a, their big bag, that's it for them. They're kind of like, all right, got the big bag. I'm over it. Right. It's 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 a terrible thing, and that's the thing I struggle with right now. It's kind of like. All right, let me get some fucking motivation to, to handle this. Right, and I think to, to tie everything all back, that's why movement and change of scenery and everything like that is important a because it keeps you grounded. A consistent, like, stay on your toes. Right, right. A consistent, like, all right, I got to keep hustling. Yeah, it's, never, it's get, too yeah, never get, get too comfortable. Never get too comfortable. That, that's the message of 2024. I think that's the big takeaway from 2024. Don't get too comfortable. This got to be the year. Something about a new year, new place. New baby, new wife. Like, for me, I'm like, man, I got to fucking go crazy. Right. Because it's a new era of my life. So wherever these people are, I don't know who's watching, whether you're watching from home, on your phone, on the drive, this got to be your fucking year. And, and like, I hate, because it's a meme now that everyone says that, but, like, it could change fucking right. fast. New year, bro. new Overnight. me, all this other stuff. And I always yeah. implore people, do something, challenge yourself, on a, have something on a small scale that you do every single day and track yeah. it. Have you hold yourself accountable, maybe get yourself an accountability partner, something of that nature, so you stay as can see. Like right now, for January, I'm doing 100 burpees every single day. It may not seem, well, to some people who don't exercise, it's a lot. To people who do exercise, it's a uh, lot. It's still a lot, you yeah. know. But it, I, I put it at a situation where it's like, hey, I can't lay my head down at night if I do not do these 100 burpees. And the beautiful thing about it is, even when I live stream and I talk to the people about it, I'm like, hey, listen, you ain't gotta do 100 in a row, it's just do 100 in the day. day. If you gotta do 10 every hour, hit that floor, do the 10 every hour, but hold yourself to get something done. And you'd be be amazed at what happens in 30 days. And what's crazy too, is just the consistency. It's fun, I could do it one day, but the fucking 30 days, that's where people lose. Uh, I think, for you, this is a side note, you got great cardio, bro. No, fucking thanks. guy took the stairs up here. Bro, he took the fucking stairs up here. Yeah, yeah, I thought he was joking because yeah. he came in, no sweat. He was just like, he was like, yeah, I take the stairs up here. I couldn't get up. I was like, what? Mm. No, nah, that's false. First of all, no, 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 untrue. You know how I know? You need a code to get into the stairs. No, you don't. Yes, you do. They don't. Want to bet? I took the stairs <laughs> from I live here. because I walked in. I, ho- I hopped into the elevator. Somebody had recognized the oh, hat that I had. So, so it went up to floor 10. And when I was pressing on the you. PH okay, button, yeah. um, for whatever reason, you need a code to get in. So I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, so, so, took, I got okay, in. so you took it from the 10th floor. 10th floor. Because I went in, and then nah, that's where it came from. There it yeah, is. That's okay. what I said. Yeah, it's I hopped ba- in there. It's still oh. bad because you still have to climb like 20, 20 Yeah, because I think it was 20, 20, 24, 20, 23. This is 28. 28. Oh, well, what do you know? I wasn't looking at the numbers, but so I just yeah. kept going up. Jordan Peterson says, uh, never lie. Always tell the truth or at least don't lie. That's exactly what he said. He actually. lied. No, he didn't. He no? Yeah, I did take, because oh, I said, because yeah. remember, I said I got into the elevator. Yeah, because yeah, I said I, t- I took the um, the elevator up to the 10th yeah, floor, okay. and then from that point, once I got yeah, out, yeah. I'm like, and I, I sent you I in the message. I thought you were like a, like, a, like a day walker, and you just stumbled into my oh, place, no, 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 and no, no, got in the staircase, and cl- that's scary. Right, because... If someone mm. had let you up to their floor, right, 
and then you then you came up. That yeah, because I went to the concierge yeah. and I asked him like, hey, um, I'm I'm here to you know Lacad penthouse and whatever. They're like, yeah, yeah, you just gotta um get the code and then go to the elevator. So I walked to the elevator location. I thought it was like one of those other things where you have to press and then put in the code. So the guy held the um elevator for me. I'm like, all right. So I walked in oh, there. Said it, when we had a brief conversation, we went to the tenth floor and I'm pressing PH and I'm like, oh, I have to put a code. So I had wrote you and then once yeah. I had gotten to the floor, I'm like, does this take me back downstairs? They're like, yeah, it would take you back downstairs. I'm like, all right, I'll just get off here. And then I wrote you a message like, oh, well, I, I hope there's some stairs. And immediately I made up my mind, like, why would I just sit over here, wait for a code? All right, where's the stairs? So I yeah. walked over to the west stairs west and then went up stairs. the, started just going up the stairs until I figured if I get to the, top, the highest yeah. floor, that would be the penthouse area. So Valid. then just walked up the stairs well, and then yeah, here we are. It's crazy. So this, I'm going to end this. I'm going to take us out on this. That's this fire, by the way. You got, you got great cardio, one. Cause I did, I do those stairs at the end of my workout every day. Cause my workout, I'm fucking exhausted. But in order to just push myself, I'm like, fuck it, stairs. I can't take the elevator up, right? But this made me think of this, this last piece, this last lesson I'm gonna give to you. Isn't it crazy that the, the person that lives in the penthouse, you're the first one in the elevator and you're the last one out. But in order to be in the penthouse, you gotta be the first one in the office and the last one out. And in the gym, you're the first one in the gym and the last one out. So I think it's funny to draw a parallel that like the first person in the office and the last one out is also the first one in the elevator and the last one out because they're living in the penthouse. And to add on that, isn't it crazy how people that live on the second floor are taking the elevator and the person that lives in the penthouse is taking the stairs from the ground floor all the way up and people are too lazy to do that? So I think it speaks a lot to, I don't know, I like drawing parallels and relating mm -hmm. to things that aren't even related, but it's just weird to think about that like, hey, that's crazy because the person that spends the most time working, building, first one in, last one out, funny enough, in the penthouse, is also the first one in, last one out. 100%, 100%, so. very profound way to end this episode yeah. of the Assiduous Podcast. And again, I am the diligent, vigilant, meticulous, sagacious, conscientious, analytical, analytical methodical, individual, the chiseled Adonis. Adonis. He is a serial entrepreneur. The Filipino, Filipino prince. Tycoon. 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 Renee Lacard. And this is We Are. Assiduous. Oh, I need a piece so bad, bro. Mm -hmm.